<laughs> I uh, was in Egypt most recently for the Globe and Mail covering the Arab Spring, um, and I think that that story is so important in the context of this discussion because I think it has really crystallized things for, for journalists and also for, um, for observers of the media in terms of how media is muzzled. And I, and I really think that it also highlighted a little bit of what Alan uh, and Michelle was talking about earlier in terms of the difference between foreign reporters and, um, and uh, I guess, you know, indigenous reporters or, or local reporters. Um, I flew to Egypt as a foreign correspondent, as a foreign reporter. I, was, I managed to get myself arrested and mobbed in the space of 10 days. <laughs> it's quite remarkable, actually, that I got into so much trouble in so little time. Um, other journalists were treated the same way. In all, almost all of these countries, foreign reporters have been identified um, by the regimes as against the regime, as, um, as the people who are inciting violence and inciting revolution. And this, of course, is no coincidence. The regimes are arguing this because they don't want the story of what's actually happening on the ground to get out to people. And um, I think that they decided to, um, to arrest, to detain, to beat up foreign reporters because they perhaps believe that that would prevent the story from getting out. And of course, what we've seen in the Arab Spring more than, any, more than anything is that um, they failed to do that because there are all sorts of other people, bloggers, citizen journalists, who have um, really taken up that space, taken up the, the task, really, of telling their own stories to the world. And now with tri Twitter and Facebook and all of the other sort of social media tools, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to muzzle um, those people, the journalists who are telling their own stories. The governments, of course, have realized this in a lot of these countries. That's why you saw um, Mubarak shut down the internet. Um, that's why you saw Syria do the same in, in a lot of these, uh, you know, other countries following suit. There's something else that goes on with this, I'll just raise this. A lot of major news organizations now not only get hostile environments training, they work with former military people in the field about staying safe once they're there. And that is, can be a very good thing when you're in a place that we're all hell is breaking loose. Um, there is a danger that we start to see all these stories through the prism of the military. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say anything against the fact, well, I know we have soldiers in Afghanistan and, and I believe um, no matter what people think about war, when you have soldiers fighting in your name, you document what they're doing and what happens to them. But the real story of war is what happens to civilians. And there's a danger when you're so worried about what's going to happen to you in your hostile environment that you forget you're really there to talk to the people who are actually living in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of the best reporting I've ever seen, there was a woman who worked for The Guardian in the 90s named Maggie O'Kane. She wore a little flowered dress and she slung her computer and a water bottle over her shoulder and she'd get on a bus with refugees and she'd be on that bus for six hours. And she'd get off the bus and she'd win every big award the British had. And, and you know, this was before, I mean, we were doing, we, that's when we started hostile environments training because so many people were getting shot and killed. Um, but, um, but, you know, there's a danger in going too close to that because the military has a job it's not our job. And we really do have to take it, you know, we, we, we need to see it through the prism of the people who live there, as opposed to the prism of what we expect it to be or what our governments mm -hmm. expect it to be. And I, I think all of that is something that we have to weigh. Mm -hmm. And I agree, I mean, you're there to see what, the, you're there to report on what the people feel. Right. So forget the book, background is good, trust me. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, talk to them, mm -hmm. ask them what they think, yeah. and they will tell you. I read a really disturbing um, statistic on the, on the car ride over here, which was um, about the types of journalists who are uh, imprisoned right now. And there was a figure um, from something called the prison census of 145. 69 of those 145 are bloggers. So these are not institutional journalists. These are people who, who blog, who tweet. Um, and I think that that really shows something really significant. It shows how journalism, again, is transferring to, um, to citizens more than ever before. And it also shows how effective they are because they're really freaking some of these states out. I mean, these people are landing them, you know, they're getting arrested, they're getting jailed, they're getting uh, uh, asked to come for coffee by the Mukhabarat, and then they're getting, you know, you know their, their freedom is taken away. So I think that the most interesting part of this discussion today is where citizen journalists fit into all of this. Um, I don't think it's necessarily um, us on the podium, per se, um, as foreign correspondents anymore. 
I think it's really uh, shifting to actually people who are conducting journalism in a different way and being incredibly brave and also incredibly effective in their own countries. News organizations yeah. tend to send our own people because of a sense that, and there's some rationale for that, the sense that, well, I'm going to know what matters to Canadians. I'll have an understanding uh, where what's happening in Rwanda fits into sort of the Canadian uh, whatever. But I, I still think we lose something. And we should, at a minimum, be doing both. And news organizations, I know foreign desks have Rolodexes of of stringers, people who they've used before that are reliable, that they could call upon. But I'm not sure that we systematically seek out journalists who could help us to understand the corners of the world that, uh, you know, as the technology gets better, we, we contract as a news organization. So there are fewer foreign correspondents with the conventional bureaus. So we should be making better use of these journalists who understand their, the societies that they're writing about because they live there. They're born there and raised there. But it is a challenge, and I think you have to, again, look at ways of dealing with training issues. Do they have the right training to be able to meet our professional standards, equipment and resources? Although increasingly, uh, technology starts to erase some of those barriers. People can, uh, they can do the work and they can get it to you uh, within a day, within a news cycle. And I think, I think you have a responsibility to the people you go up to. So depending on what country you're in, I think um, many countries you have to assume that you're being watched closely, not, not to become paranoid, but, but uh, the security service in, uh, for instance, Pakistan, they would know every time a foreign journalist is in the country. Yemen, absolutely, you, you definitely s stick out there. Um, Syria is a country like that. Um, I know one time when I was in Syria, uh, they, the guy who was following me either wanted me to know or, you know, was not very, very good at it because, you know, I could sort of <laughs> see him dart behind a, a building every corner I went around. Um, and so just by people that I would approach and try and talk to, that could actually, even if they didn't talk to me, that could put them at risk. So I think you've got to sort of be aware of that, um, watch your surroundings and, and think about carefully who you talk to, how you talk to them. And also remembering that people who talk to you, you have to know where they're coming from. So sometimes, too, you know, this all goes to checking out your sources. That could be interesting what they're saying, but then if you dig a little deeper to that person is, find out what their affiliation is. I mean, we're seeing that right now in, in Tripoli. Uh, the, the Western journalists who are there are very clearly being, you know, they're all at one hotel. They're being clearly taken out to, to one area each day so uh, Gaddafi's forces can show what they want. And in that case, I mean, journalists are writing about that. But, but I mean, it's often there's, there's propaganda and you just have to be careful about it.